Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live. Hope you are well today. Just had a good morning PT with 800 high school kids doing summer seminar at the Naval Academy. That's always a pump. Um, tell you what, man, you don't miss any reps when you're up there on a stage working out in front of 800 people. You, it's it's a performance enhancing situation for sure. It's a lot of fun though. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about uh, some common issues I'm seeing uh, at the pool as well as some submitted videos. Just people having a hard time with kicking um, or should I say they're they're kicking, they're just not kicking well and it is causing them to be really slow in their CSS. In fact, I've seen some people go from swimming 10 minutes hot or slower down into the sub nine region just by fixing their kick in the with the combat swimmer stroke. And typically what most people do when they screw up <clears throat> is they do a scissor kick on their side, but right in the middle of their kick, they roll over on their belly before they've even finished closing their legs to finish their kick. And what that 90 degree angle does is turn your scissor kick, which may be pretty powerful, into almost like a, a very weak breaststroke kick that's really ineffective. So you're missing out on probably 50% of your power by not staying in one position to finish the kick, close your legs, and during that one Mississippi, two Mississippi pull, you can roll over if you want to. You don't have to. You can stay on your side the whole time when you do the combat swimmer stroke, which is really a modified side stroke. So kick, close your legs, slow the glide down to your belly versus kick it in the middle and next thing you know you've you've lost all the hip power that you needed to really create a powerful kick um let's see uh some drills that are very helpful with this situation are uh swimming with fins so we do a couple of things we will do the 50 50 swim workout with a pair of fins but it's a little different because what you're doing is you're going to swim freestyle down and back, just drag your feet and just use your arms. Um, but on the 50 CSS, instead of constant flutter kicks to get across the pool, I want you to actually do a scissor kick and glide and practice a proper scissor kick and glide to where you are pushing down pushing down with the bottom of the front leg and pushing down with the top of the back leg and you're clamping it together because that's really going to be the same kind of movement you're doing without fins. And with fins, it's basically like weight training, right? You're just developing those muscles to be a little stronger when you do scissor kicks without fins. Um, however, I will say this, whenever I'm swimming with fins for long distance, like for instance, at one o'clock today, I'm about to go swimming, probably do a mile, maybe a little longer. I tend to do constant flutter kicks and just use my arms when I need to breathe versus scissor kick, little flutter kicks, scissor kick, little flutter kicks. It's up to you though. You can kind of figure it out. On my weak side, I definitely do constant flutter kicks, but on my strong side, sometimes I'll throw in a scissor kick in there, but not too often. But a good way to practice that is just do that drill. Another way to do it is with fins or without is to add to your 50-50 swim workout a 25-meter um kickboard drill where you just lay lay on the your head on your shoulder your hands on top of the kickboard on your side and you just kick and glide kick and glide and see if you can create a two to three second glide during that kick 
And the way it works is when you mix it with the 50-50, you do 25 across the pool. If you have a 25 meter pool, if you have a 50 meter pool, just do 50. But if you do 25, you get one length across the pool. And then you do 50 free, 50 CSS. You grab that kickboard again, do 25 across the pool. So basically, we're just reinforcing learning a proper kick. And we're interrupting a normal 50-50 with just a 25 kickboard drill. That has been so helpful with new guys that have come to me and are just really slow with their swim. Um, they got everything else right. They got the timing right of the stroke. They got good streamline, good pull, and it looks like their kick is fine until you just watch that they go almost nowhere after that kick. And then once they fix that kick, they're really a whole lot faster. So you guys that uh, just came on, hook me up with a uh, punch, punch that like button. And since that's what we run on over here, and I'm going to share some videos that were submitted this week. And we will discuss those. So. Until I see a question, I'm just going to go with, um, I'm just going to go with the, uh, the sharing some videos here. Let me see what we got here. Make sure I got it pulled up. Okay. So let me share my screen. All right. So you guys can see that should be now let's uh let's see what this looks like already i can see looks like he kicks off the wall throws a little dolphin kick in there that's good try to work on your dolphin kick a little bit it doesn't have to be such a big knee bend it should be more from the hips and more of a whip kick down now we'll say this um it's not a particularly fast css but that's okay. Those big fins are kind of hard to play with when you first get them on. And it does look like you're, um, it does look like you're bicycling a little bit. Now, when you go this way, it looks a little bit better, but I think your problem is your kicks are too small. Like this is like a, small flutter kick where it needs to be more of a bigger or I should say a moderate flutter kick. It doesn't need to be so huge that you're doing the splits almost like a scissor kick, but it could be a little bit bigger. So right now I'm looking at like maybe 12, 15 inch flutter kicks with too much knee bend. Um, my advice would be try to get 24 to 30 inch flutter kicks so they're just a little bit bigger and you'll get a lot more power out of those fans now we'll say this if you're new to swimming with those fans this may be all you can do at first but you just got to get used to it but try to open up those legs a little bit and use your hips a little more versus your your knees that's a good one Still looks good. I mean, it's a little slow. Um, it's a hundred meter swim in a minute forty four. Actually, that's not slow at all. That's one hundred and four seconds for a hundred meters. You're you're swimming at faster than a yard per second when you make the conversion from meters to yards. So, you know, now you just got to be able to do that. Um, you know, for another several. 100 more meters because I would recommend trying to get a thousand at, um, you know, that 17 minute mark or less. This is a pace that could do that. I uh, would also try to get 2000 at the 35 minute mark or less. This pace could do that if you get in shape to be able to do that. And then, Ultimately, 
you're going to do 4,000 yards, which is two miles, uh, two nautical miles of swimming. And if you can maintain this pace, you'll be under 70 minutes to do that, which is really a good, uh, good swim pace. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different when you have tides and currents pushing and pulling you uh, in the open water and you got to swim straight. So there are some issues that you will have. But the good news is when you first get to Buds, if you're going to Buds, um, you have 85 minutes to fail this test. I should say, if you get slower than 85 minutes, you fail. You have 85 minutes to pass. Um, so if you go in there 10, 15 minutes under that minimum standard, that's going to put you in the front of the class, but it's also going to build in some gravy time in there. So in case the currents are bad or in case you don't swim very straight your first time doing it, you're still in that window to pass the test. And then as you do this every week, you're going to get better and better. Next thing you know, you know, you're in the 70s week after week and may may even be in the 60s if you really push it. So you guys got any questions for me? Uh, looks like I see one here uh, from Christian. Um, when you refer to swimming with fins, do you mean big fins like in this video? Yes, um, I do. But if you're new to swimming, you may want to just put on the easy slip on snorkel fins i use a pair from sporty s-p-o-r-t-i just an easy slip-on fin um they will make you a little faster compared to the rocket fins but the rocket fins are built for power getting through currents and tides and waves and things like that versus these little slip-on fins are built for speed in a pool they typically don't do well, or you have to really kick hard if you're going to try to get through a current with those little fins, whereas the, the big fins can just steady flutter kick, motorboat it right on through. Um, let's see. Man, I, th I tell you, I think I have a few videos for you guys, but I'm not 100% sure. This one's without fins. Okay, let's see what this one looks like. All right, Let's see if I can share my screen. You guys see that? All right, so ready from the start, I see good kick off the wall. So good kick off the wall, double arm pull, transit. It, okay, that was that was weird. What happened there? Yeah, so there was, yeah, usually when you go from here to here, you want to hold this position. And I think your kick is just ineffective to create any momentum for you after you do that. You can kind of see it like he went nowhere after that kick. And that's very typical. The only play, only time you're really going forward is that top arm pull. So now you, you kind of get some momentum going from that top arm pull. But if you notice, there's nothing about that kick that is pushing you forward very fast that is so i think this is a 50 meter pool and this is going to take you uh let's see looks like almost 70 seconds to get this done yeah 73 seconds so that's a minute 13 um, you you want to be under a minute on this. And I think a couple of issues you're having is this glide, one Mississippi, two. Yeah, like you're not gliding long enough, but it's really kind of stemming from your kick is not being uh, strong enough. So everything I just mentioned earlier about kicking drills, get a kickboard, let's practice this drill and really work on that whip kick. It's I'm trying to see if you're rolling over on this one. This one doesn't look like you're rolling over. It just looks 
really weak. Like that back leg is not whipping hard enough. You know, if you look at this, I would say like there's nothing wrong in this stroke other than you're not gliding long enough and your kick is weak. So you got that going for you. But as far as the actual mechanics of the stroke, it looks good. We just got to figure out what's up with the kick. Now, it could be those, I don't know if those are baggy shorts and you got pockets that are just like stopping you from gliding. Something I would consider too is maybe getting some jammers. And when you do time yourself, find out if this is a meter pool or a yard pool because it makes a huge difference. Because 500 meters is 550 yards. So that's basically doing an extra lap in a 25-yard pool um, that is just going to, you know, basically add a minute almost to your, your swim. So make sure if you're taking the Navy PST, which is a 500-yard swim, that you're in a yard pool. If you're in a meter pool, do the math. Because 450 meters equals 500 yards. So instead of 10 laps, you just do nine in a 25 meter pool. Let's see. Is there a particular time of year you recommend guys shipping to buds? Uh, no. Um, the, the one recommendation, recommendation that I make for guys wanting to go to boot camp and then go to buds is... My advice is don't ship out 10 weeks before Christmas because what's going to happen is if you ship, let's say you ship in November, guess where you're spending Christmas? At Navy boot camp. Had you just gone two months earlier or a month earlier sometimes, you would be in Bud's prep. You get a week off at Christmas. You can train. If you got sick, you can heal up, you know, whatever you want to do. You can go home, you know, use Christmas leave as a rest and recovery slash training tool versus a wasted vacation uh, stuck at boot camp. You will regret that decision, especially when you find out everybody else is just chilling out while you're folding laundry, standing at attention. So that's the big thing. In fact, I have guys right now that are thinking about shipping. And I said, well, you better ship early October because it's a 10 week deal. So that'll get you out of there mid December. Um, you fly out to Coronado, check in and you take Christmas leave. Um, um, or go after Christmas. Only problem with that is you're dealing, you know, with those cold winds and the polar vortex of Great Lakes outside of Chicago, and that winter is cold. Might make you tougher, though. So you got that going for you as well. So it, it's kind of up to you, really. My my suggestion is don't waste the Christmas leave at boot camp. That's the only thing that really matters. As far as Buds is concerned, you're going to be there for six to eight months. Six months of Buds, eight months of pre-Buds, you know, total. Um, so what you'll do is you're going to be there for a winter, regardless of when you show up. So if you're trying to avoid the winter, you're going to get it at some point. I happened to show up there in August. So it was the end of summer. It was warm, but not crazy hot. Got a couple hot days in there. And then by the time we were doing Hell Week, it was October. Um, and then, you know, that wasn't s s freezing, but it wasn't hot either during the day. So it was kind of nice. Um but I will say this, I was colder in second phase dive phase than I ever was at Hell Week or anything first phase. That was 
diving in the winter was really cold. Though nobody quit because of it, because you're kind of doing cool stuff. You know, you're doing ship attacks, you know, and you just try to stay above the thermocline. So below 15 feet, it dropped like 10 degrees. So you just kind of hovered around 12, 13 feet the whole time you were swimming. And you were relatively warm, probably water in the 50s, probably 55 degrees, but you had a wetsuit on. It was still cold. So there's really no best time to be there because you're going to be there pretty much through all four seasons. It's 25 miles per week, good pace intervals, timed runs, hill sufficient for a Buds candidate. Yeah, it is, but also is, so is 40. So I, I think everybody's a little bit different. I, I am really trying not to be an absolutist and say you need 40 or 50 miles a week to, to prepare for Buds because it really kind of depends on your athletic history. You know, as long as you're hitting four mile timed runs and 27, 28 minutes easily, you can crush your PST. Um, you know, you can get extra cardio from biking, rowing, swimming, um, without the necessary, or I should say, without the unnecessary impact pains of running another 25 miles a week. Will it? build some resilience if you do yes but it may also put you in the hurt locker as well and now you can't ship out because you got stress fractures so everybody's going to be a little bit different on that number my suggestion is make sure you can crush the pst you got the four mile timed run and you're comfortable with anywhere between 25 and 40 miles a week of running you don't have to be at 40 miles a week forever, but getting up there a couple of times may not be a bad idea, but at a minimum, I would say 25 miles a week for sure. Some people will say higher. Um, I'm not in that camp. So there you go. Do I need long distance run or is it okay to get all my 20 miles in 800 meter sprints got 13 miles in two days so far um i wouldn't recommend 800 meter sprints because you're really working a different energy system compared to a four mile timed run so you need to work that aerobic base as well so my suggestion would be if you're if you want to do more 800s that's fine but do different paces of 800. So you got a six minute mile for 800s. So you're gonna do a 803 minutes, right? That'd be a logical uh, pace to get a six minute mile for a nine minute mile and a half. But you know, you can also back it down a notch and hit, you know, sub seven or sub seven pace with like a 320, 325, 330, get you at that seven minute mile which you also need to learn to be able to do multiple miles at that pace. So the two miles I recommend striving for is a six minute mile and a seven minute mile. If you can get comfortable with both, when you pick it up to a faster pace, you can do a six minute mile, but if you can, you know, get your long, slow distance pace, so to speak to a seven minute mile, that is key, and that's going to take some aerobic conditioning. A sprint is not aerobic. Okay, that is anaerobic, and it's fine to do. I love sprints. We run hill sprints, and we do interval sprints. In fact, one of my favorites is like a quarter mile fast and then a quarter mile slow to where you can act. You're still jogging, but you're catching your breath during that slow, and uh, that was a great little interval you do that for two miles non-stop and you start seeing where your recovery is coming in strong on that 400 meter jog that you're able to recover from that so my advice is diversify your running don't just do sprints don't just do long slow distance don't just do goal pace stuff i mean mix it up mix it all up but run with a purpose you know, run with a purpose to where you're in that six to seven minute window for as most of your training. 
And if you want to do a nice, easy, slower paced jog, like an eight minute mile pace for, you know, I don't know, eight, 10 miles, it's kind of up to you if you need the distance. It's a good aerobic based conditioning, but biking, swimming, rowing, elliptical, elliptical with a weight vest on, it's really tough or a stair stepper with a weight vest on, you know, those are good ways to work the legs and the lungs without the impact of, you know, 50 miles of, of running. So I think where a lot of people screw up is one, they're not running athletes, meaning, yes, you might be a sprinter on a track or you might be a football player who runs, obviously, but you're not an endurance running athlete and some of the advice given to I'm going to call you a non-running athlete from running coaches and running athletes really may not be what you need, right? I can tell a running athlete to go six, you know, run 60, 70 miles long, slow distance a week. And that's, that's what they do. You know, they're 140 pounds and they run for a living. Um, but this is a lot more than just being a, a great runner. You know, you can be a good runner and limit your mileage to 25, 35 miles a week, just as long as you're hitting those paces, you don't need to be world-class and hit a five minute mile. You know, you don't need to be running 70 miles a week, you know, like a cross country runner, you know, Find something logical that makes sense. And remember, you're a tactical athlete. You're not world-class in anything. You're just good at everything. So, And your athletic history usually drives that determination on whether or not you need more miles or not. Do I recommend any shin-specific work to prevent shin splints and buds? Um, Yeah. I mean, anything you can do, work your calves, work your heels, uh, foam roll, stretch, ankle mobility is really huge. You know, keep your uh, keep your ankles loose and most likely your shins will be loose as well. So, yeah, good one. Good question. That's what I do. So toe raises, heel raises, walk backwards up a hill. Um, Walk on your heels, right? Really flex your your shins, but also stretch them, you know, and get a ballerina point. So you got zero, almost a zero degree angle between your shin and your foot whenever you uh, stretch it. Wanted to let you know, I've been using your guide to Navy SEAL Fitness, swimming 512 minutes, got it down to 830, auto quad my first PST. Nice. That's what I'm talking about. Man, it doesn't take a whole lot to auto qual your first PST. And you know what happens when you do? Everybody takes you seriously in that group. Because I bet you, you saw probably half a dozen or more people not even pass the PST and they're already in the delayed entry program and just failing PSTs every week. One, it's a horrible way to interview for your future job. You know, you show up and you fail everything. Yeah. Guess what? You know, no one's going to take you seriously. And if you try to call the recruiter and ask them something, even the recruiter is going to say, yeah, I'll call him back later. You know, but, You know what happens whenever you auto qual your first PST? Guess who's calling you? The recruiter, right? He's saying, all right, we got you going and we got a ship date for you. When do you want to go? All right. (laughs) They will be proactive in making sure your process is streamlined because they see you as a serious candidate. They don't have to train you every week to not fail a PST anymore. And you can spend the time and delayed entry program focusing on getting through buds. That's how it works. Unfortunately, a majority of people who go to buds do not understand that, you know, and and people always talk about how buds is the hardest training in the world. You know, I'm going to disagree with that and just say, 
it is littered with the most unqualified students in the world. That's why the attrition rate's so high. <clears throat> it's hard, don't get me wrong. And the attrition rates are outrageous, but they're outrageous because of the students' fault. Historically, there were some times when, you know, Bud's classes around COVID got out of hand and attrition rates went sky high and they made it harder than it needed to be. But that's a different story. All right, Sebastian, what do you say? So far, my longest I can slow run about is 30 minutes. That's fine. Which is only at 10 kilometers per hour, which I think is somewhere between 9, 10 minute mile. Yeah, I give it that. Uh, my best mile is a 627. Um, yeah, that's fine. That's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. 627, 1600 meter run. That's good. It's not bad. You know, it could be faster. But if you're if you're able to string, you know, some seven minute miles together, that'd be a good progress. So you can hit a mile at 630. Let's try to back it down a notch and hit a seven and then do that for two or three miles and see if you're somewhere around, you know, 21 minutes for your 5K. That, that'd be a good next challenge for you just to see where your seven minute mile conditioning is. So I say 5K just because you're, you're using kilometers. Um, so 3.1 miles be around that 27 minute zone 2730 I'm sorry 2130 27s for four miles it's a long ways to go to get my four, 35 minute five mile go you know what you'd be surprised it's not you know the fact that you can run one mile in 630 and then pull the reins on yourself a little bit I guarantee you you start running a mile at seven minutes and start doing mile repeats instead of worrying about 400s and 800s at this point. My suggestion is start doing mile and mile and a half repeats. So somewhere in your workout, you do a mile, seven minutes, right? Do a little bit of calisthenics or whatever, do another mile in seven minutes, do a little more, do another mile in seven minutes, or you have an entire track workout where you do four or five mile repeats, meaning you're going to run four laps around a track and walk one, four laps around a track, walk one and see, see how long you can keep up the seven minute pace. You'll be surprised. It, it won't be long because you're already running fast enough. You just now have to just get in better running shape and you can mix that in with bikes too. Something I like to do if, you know, if, if let's say five miles is kind of too much for you to run right now, my advice would be to maybe do two and a half and bike for 20 minutes prior to running. And you hit those bikes hard too, like pyramid bikes. So every minute on the minute, you increase the resistance or the speed. Every, you can do, a, you know, Tabata intervals for, you know, 20 seconds fast, 10 seconds slow for, 10, 15, 20 minutes, you know, with a minute off somewhere in there. Um, that That is how I would build my cardio up for what you're trying to do. One method is get the distance in running. The other method is give it a 50-50 split between non-impact cardio, especially if you're susceptible to any uh, running type injuries. Good questions. Any tips on losing weight? I'm trying to out for seal i'm running swimming and working out every day well that's good that's what you should be doing uh chances are if that is not helping you lose weight something is wrong with how much you are eating because it really is how much you bring in and you need to bring in food so you have energy to burn it but if you're trying to lose weight you got to eat a little less work out a little more and, you know, get on a good nutrition plan. In fact, I'll send you something that I like 
uh, this article I wrote because nutrition is part of your recovery, but it's also part of your energy system so you can work out harder and burn more calories. So you need good carbs. You need good calories. And that is how it works. What are your four favorite stretches? What are your favorite stretches, exercises for better streamline for the upper back? Um, good question. Uh, it's all shoulder uh, work. So I tend to do, you know, big bear hugs, you know, stretch out my shoulders this way. Chest openers, you know, lay on a foam roller, like parallel with your spine and like try to get your, you know, everything on the ground. Um, you know, that'll open you up and then work to get your biceps on your ears and lock those arms out. Like I can't do it because of these headphones on there, but your biceps get, stay on your ears and just hold it, hold that thing and make sure here, here's a big thing too. You're going to swim like a banana if you're doing this. So you got to work on getting, you know, stretching your chest, got to stretch your chest in order to get your shoulders back a little more and get it that way. So your perfect posture in there and you can see some of my stretches that I do on mobility day. Um, let's see, treading. So treading is a, a big mobility issue, but there's an exercise I like to do. Um, a couple of different ones, actually. Let me share this with you. So this is an article I wrote about treading water. One, a lot of people screw up treading water because of what they think the egg beater is. They think their legs are going this way like an egg beater, where they actually need to be going this way in order to produce a downward force so you go up. So don't get stuck in the egg beater name because spinning your legs in a circle in this plane is just going to suck you under, whereas it needs to be in a vertical plane. Um, but anyway, these are some of my stretches I like. It's called the frog pose out of yoga. You know, you get on all fours, put your ankles against the floor, uh, try to come up 45 degree angle, and then, oh, let me get a little bigger. And then if you notice, what I'm doing here is I am sitting all the way back. And you can do this one of two ways. You can have your feet splayed like this, where it looks like a breaststroke kick. Like you're, I'm basically keeping the inside of my feet on the ground and notice my arms and shoulders are straight up over my head. Or you can put your feet up underneath you and work your ankles and shins a little bit better. So the top of your feet are up against the floor and there's no angle in between that kick, um, bet between that stretch. In fact, I may be able to Find another one for you. Oh, here you go. Look at this one. That's a good ankle stretch right there. So if you just sit on your shins and have your ankles so that you're making no daylight there, that's a really good ankle stretch for you. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, those are just some of my favorites that I like to do, not just for the upper back, but the ankles are very important. Uh, hips are very important, uh, inner thigh, outer thigh, glutes, all those really matter when it comes to swimming. But yes, for a better streamlined body position, it's all shoulder mobility. So my suggestion is watch a video on streamlining. Um, I, wrote, I wrote this article on streamlining the most important things about streamlining and you can see it and I put a few stretches in there they're they're okay in fact here let me uh share this one with you this is a military.com article I wrote and you can see some of the stretches here that I posted in here um reverse push-ups birds arm haulers they're great little stretches or flexes that stretch the chest by flexing the upper back. This is a classic arm shoulder stretch. 
We call these high jack, high jills. Um, just trying to stretch out the old chest stretch, loosen that up, tricep stretch into a lat stretch. All of those are going to help you create this type of streamline. You know, you see his chin is tucked. His uh, arms are straight, one hand on top of the other. Get another big glide there. Yeah, sweet. Good question, sir, Caden. All right, any more questions for me? I think I'm out of videos to share with you today, but I did post another one. Let me um, let me go over here to my TikTok. If you guys haven't followed me on TikTok, if you don't want the app, I get it. You can just go to the TikTok.com website and just follow this address. In fact, uh, this address right here is my TikTok address at Stu Smith 50. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. You can go over to Instagram, Stu Smith 50, same address here. And I got a whole bunch of reels that are very helpful. But let me share. Let me share my TikTok page here. Um, and I posted up a, a new one. In fact, common error on the on the uh, on the kick. You guys see this? All right. So notice what he's doing. He's got a big scissor kick. It's probably a little bit too big, a little bit weak. But notice what he's doing in the middle of a scissor kick. See how he rolls over in the middle of that kick. So what I recommend is don't roll over in the middle of your kick. Roll over during the glide if you want to. You don't have to. Top arm, bottom arm, kick. Yeah, the only thing he's really screwing up is here is he has a weak kick from rolling over in the middle of it. And you can see how it turns into almost like a little breaststroke kick in the middle of the of the rollover. Oh, that's weird. Sometimes he's not even rolling over on this side. So on one side, like this one, he's rolling over when he's facing us with his left arm on the top. He could be a little tighter on that streamlined recovery too. But notice when he comes back, he actually fixes it on it. This must be a strong side where he stays on his side a little longer before he rolls over. He's got a good scissor kick on this side. The other one is not so good. So everybody has a different little strong and weak issue. You know, many of us do. Um, and you need to adjust accordingly if if you have to um, figure that out. Let's see. Last year of high school this year will be conscripting for two years next year in the military. Any advice for military life? Um, yeah, you know, military life is 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 great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um it's it's a good for me it was a good young person's job where I really um had a a, a good lesson of life learned with just discipline. And even in attention to detail and taking initiative, I think all of those were learned in my early military years. And, you know, those are things that you carry with you for the rest of your life. Um, but, yeah, my, my advice would be to, you know, get your workouts in, work all day, go to school, you know, go to school, just have a busy day. Like, don't spend a lot of time just doing nothing because a typical day in the life of a military, military student, depending if you're going through training, is you're going to do a couple of workouts in a day. You're going to be studying or doing some kind of classwork. You're going to be doing some manual labor. Um, you're just busy all day. I think where a lot of people have a hard time making that transition is you know, they, they may do a workout or two in a day, but then they go home, take a nap, chill out, you know, play some video games. You know, they're not really busy. They're not used to being busy. So my advice this next year is just get used to being busy. 
you know, do do school all day, go to practice afterwards or work out and then do homework. And if you got a part time job, take a part time job, make your life a little bit busier. You know, there's nothing wrong with learning how to do hard work. Um, because, you know, sometimes sometimes you'll be bored out of your mind in the military, too, because there's nothing to do. So you got to there's al- there's always something to do. You just have to have some initiative and, and get it done, whether it's work on your own workouts or work out as a group or get stuff done that, you know, is going to be done, needs to be done next week. Tom, uh, great questions. Uh, I say great answer, too. Well, thank you. Um, I can do the Cooper test two times per, or can I do the Cooper test two times per week? I'm trying to improve my pace by 12 minutes in the 12 minutes. Um, sure, that's fine. But you know, don't let a test ruin your workouts. What I mean by that is most people see progress um, doing the workouts and then testing to assess their abilities that they've gained from working out. But by taking it twice, what you can do is start to create strategies of when to pace yourself, when to push yourself. And next thing you know, you've created a nice little test-taking strategy because you've taken the test enough that you now know um, you know, how to do it. You're kind of getting in shape to do it better. Um, all of those things are really important. I, th- I think one of the worst things I've ever seen is when people take a PST or a fitness test for the first time and it's game day and it matters, right? They've never practiced it on their own. So they've never learned any skills and technique and strategies to uh, produce better results. Because pacing is critical, especially in sit-ups and running, swimming too. Um, But yeah, it's not a bad. Something I would recommend doing if you're going to test, any day you test. Let's say your test is calisthenics and running, um, which most Cooper tests are. I think it's push-ups, sit-ups, maybe a 300-meter sprint, and a -a mile-and-a-half run. Whichever one you're not happy with, do a secondary workout right after it. So you do the test, take a 10-minute break, and because your run wasn't up to snuff that you're not happy with, do six quarter-mile runs at sub-two minutes because that'll get you under that 12-minute pace for that that mile and a half. Um, You know, if your workout or your test scores weren't good with the calisthenics, make that secondary workout be like a push-up, pull-up, sit-up pyramid um, just to practice the calisthenics a little more. Then don't do upper body the next day. Take your next day and be a leg day. So that's how my workouts are all split up is uh, usually upper body, lower body day splits because it just forces you to recover those muscle groups. Some days it's a full body day with a cardio day split. You know, it just depends. You can mix it up however you want, but just be smart and not do the same things over and over again. You are welcome, Owen. Nice work. Uh, Important things you will learn is to handle disappointments and keep going. Yes, that is very true. Military life. For example, you're told that water will be available at the next checkpoint. You show up and there's no water. Yeah, that happens. Sometimes you're just there last and all the water's gone. So um, carry enough water so you don't have to. Uh, How does your preparation differ between SEAL and EOD candidates? Um, Very little. I mean, the PST is the same. So that phase one of tactical fitness is identical. Um, there, you know, when they go through dive school, you know, they will be swimming a lot. They'll be running a lot. There's log PT. There's, um, there's a lot of calisthenics. There's a lot of pool activity. So my 
training for EOD guys, gals, is just a little bit different because the pool sessions are different. Like the pool sessions there um, during dive phase are, are just a lot of calisthenics, a lot of over-unders, um, a lot of procedures that you have to learn, whether that's a procedure to go down to the bottom, touch it and come back up. There's hand signals. There's all these little things that you have to get comfortable doing um, when you're practicing some of these skills, because it's not necessarily the, you know, the 25 meter underwater swim and the go down to the bottom, pick up a brick and swim it up there. Those aren't typically the big challenges. The challenges in it are the little rules that you have to do throughout the swim sessions. Um, you know, whenever you come up to the surface, your hands over your head, you give a hand signal for something. Okay. You know, whatever that is, you know, there are things that you have to really nail down. Um, and you have to do that too. second phase at buds. But by the time you're second phase of buds, it's really kind of a, a different learning curve uh, where you've gotten all the hard physical parts done. Now it's just tactical training. And there will be people who cannot keep up with the level of information that's coming in, um, whether it's dive physics or dive math or, you know, dive medicine. You know, those are academically challenging um tests that people have to take but then there's also all the procedures that you have to take when you're diving so to be honest with you most of my guys here locally that are going eod are doing the same workouts as the guys that are going seal um, it's just the pool is just going to be a little bit different for them and we're going to really address procedures more than anything else. Your articles give so much inspiration. Thanks for sharing them with us. Yeah, no problem. I enjoy writing articles. I write them all the time. In fact, I'm serious. If you're looking for something, like you you forget to ask me this question today, seriously, write the question or the topic in Google, put my name to it, and I've probably written an article about it. If I hadn't, email me and say, hey, I didn't see an article written on this, and I'll write an article on it. I'm always looking for new articles. In fact, I write three a week, sometimes four a week. So I always appreciate ideas for articles. In fact, a lot of times, like tomorrow, I have to write an Ask Stu article. Military.com hires me to write these articles. So I'll go through all these questions and see if there's a good one. And sometimes there's a really good one. And I'll... Uh, do a full answer on it. Hmm. Let's see. Jerry says in his country, uh, military service is mandatory after high school. I like that. Military assessed my health status to be an A, rare. Many told me I just, to fake issues otherwise, I'll be sent to the commandos. What would I do? Hmm. You know, I'd be honest with you. I would. If you're going to be in the military for two years anyway, go hardcore and do something that you know is the best training in your country, whatever that is, right? But also do something that you're interested in. You know, if you want to be, you know, a police officer, do you know, military police work, or uh, if you want to be a firefighter, you know, there's firefighters jobs, you know, somewhere usually in the military. Um if you like guns or tanks or whatever, do those, you know, just find something that interests you and go after it and get some training in it. And then it may or may not have anything to do with your future endeavors when you go to the next layer of college or, or schooling or go into learn a trade or something. But sometimes it does. You know, sometimes you may learn to be a diesel mechanic in the military and then you get out and you're you're hired to be a diesel mechanic, you know, just so many things that can, can, uh, you can do. And my granddad was world war two, learned to be a diesel mechanic in world war two was a mechanic and a driver Patton's army 
and uh, drove all the way from Normandy to Berlin uh, fixing diesel trucks and vehicles. And then he got out and worked as a diesel mechanic for the next 40 years. So that's just one of many things you can do. If you're a creative type who like to think, go for a spec ops unit. If you like to just do one thing, be a gunner. That's good. Uh, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah, just if you're going to prepare for something hard, make sure you're preparing. <laughs> you know, if you're going to, if you're really interested in doing something that's physically demanding, make sure you are preparing physically to handle it so you don't get broken in the middle of it or you fail the standards. Um, yeah. Yeah, good luck. Let me know how it goes. If you got questions, just send them. All right, folks, I've been at this for almost an hour. I do need to go. I got stuff to do. Um, but I'll be back next week. And uh, I think I'm going to be on another podcast uh, this week. I was on the uh, Building the Elite podcast, which if you guys haven't seen that, it should be out this week. Over there, Building the Elite podcast. It's a great book, by the way, if you are uh, really like the science of tactical fitness. It is basically the textbook of physiology and psychology that uh, is quite impressive put together. Okay, folks, I am done. I will chat with you guys later. I appreciate your time. If you guys uh, have any questions, I missed your question, send them to me, Stu at stusmith.com. But if you're wanting to check out my programs and other articles, I have a whole bunch of them at stusmithfitness.com. Two different websites. Stu Smith Fitness is my up-to-date one. And also, if you use the Live 1-5 over there at Stu Smith Fitness, you will save 15% on books and ebooks. I appreciate your time. You guys have a good one.